Hello and welcome to the webinar on pharmacy valuation and next steps. My name is John Watkins with PRS Pharmacy Services. Before I turn it over to Scott, I just want to review the questions that uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to ask. Uh, after Scott's presentation, we will be answering any questions that are submitted either during or at the end of Scott's presentation. To do that, if you look to the right side of your screen, you're going to see a menu box and you should see a question section. So when you click into the question section, you'll be able to type in your question, hit submit. We will then read them on air and answer them. If by chance we don't get to your question due to any time constraints, you know, rest assured we will be responding via email a day or two at the conclusion of the webinar. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce you to our speaker. Scott Weaver is the Vice President of Pharmacy for PRS Pharmacy Services. In his more than 35 years with PRS, Scott has overseen the acquisition and startup of over 300 pharmacies nationwide. Most recently, he has positioned PRS Brokerage Services as a nationwide leader in guiding buyers and sellers through every step of pharmacy ownership transition. Scott received his Bachelor of Science degree in Pharmacy from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science. He is a member of the National Community Pharmacists Association, as well as the Pennsylvania Pharmacists Association. He has obtained certification as a pharmacy regulatory specialist and as an accredited business broker. He has authored or contributed to articles that have appeared in Progressive Grocer, Grocery Headquarters, as well as its annual Non-Foods Handbook, Elements Magazine, and various other publications for, for different buying groups. So with that, Scott, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you. Thanks, John, for the introduction, and hello and welcome to everyone for joining us for the webinar titled Pharmacy Valuation and Next Steps. It is my hope that I can provide you a better understanding of how to determine a fair market value for your independent pharmacy through the valuation process. In addition, those beginning stages of selling or buying a pharmacy, I hope to provide some helpful hints on how the processes should transpire. So we have a lot to cover here, let's begin. There are a number of reasons to have a pharmacy valuation. By far the top reason is the, the selling of a pharmacy to establish a fair market value. Also, those that may be buying a pharmacy have requested a valuation to try to confirm that the seller's asking price falls between a fair value. Another top reason is to determine market value. Now, a valuation can identify strengths and weaknesses of your business and allow you, the pharmacy owner, the opportunity to correct or improve problem areas. As a matter of fact, we at PRS recommend that a valuation, your first valuation be conducted maybe two to three years prior to the beginning the selling process so that adjustments can be made to either increase your net profits, decrease operating expenses, which in turn would subsequently increase the value of your pharmacy. Some of the other areas we perform valuation for is when one partner is buying out another, retirement planning, and also some estate planning. So let me set a scenario for you here. First off, the sale of a pharmacy is more than just dollar figures. It also involves changes in coworkers, can involve changes in friends, can it, and obviously changes in patients. All of which you as a pharmacy owner have been a large part of not only your professional life, but also your personal. Maybe you started the pharmacy from the, from the ground up, or maybe the pharmacy was a legacy and been in your pharmacy for decades. You know, the pharmacy may have built your home and may have put your, your kids through college and it may have paid for, paid for weddings. And in, in all cases, it was definitely a way of life. So, it's hard to determine 
the range of emotions an owner might experience if they go through the sales process. And even though emotions can't be planned, they will be present. The, the selling you the pharmacy will be one of the most important professional transactions you make. And more times than not, may be the only time. This will also, in most cases, also apply to the buyer. So I can assure you that the sellers value their pharmacy and think it is worth more than the buyer, buyers are worth. So why a pharmacy valuation is important for not only determining a fair market value for the seller, it also raises negotiations from a le level of personal opinion. In other words, we try to get the emotional side out of it to a rational analysis for both the buyer and the seller. So what is the, the valuation process? Well, first off, it's not an exact science. Basically, we obtain financial data. We put it into tested formulas to determine a price, way, price range for the pharmacy to sell. The financial data we typically look for is last three years profit and loss, last three years balance statements, the last three year tax return, and the last document inventory value. However, it's important to note that we do not include the following financials when determining a valuation. Any cash, accounts receivable and accounts payable. And the reason is normally these do not transfer over to the buyer and are typically the responsibility of the seller to reconcile prior to the closing. Other two items are any buildings, real estate or, or land. And these are done through a separate uh, appraisal done by a licensed real estate appraiser. Also, any vehicles, and typically they may be done by the um, by a, a, a blue, po blue book, and again, all liabilities, because again, the liabilities are typically the responsibility of the seller to reconcile at the closing. Now, now that we, we address the financial part, uh, I want to spend some time verifying a very important topic that you'll hear us talking about quite a bit as we move through the process. And that topic is EBITDA. Now, those of you that get involved in selling or buying, you'll, you'll hear this, this term often, especially as you begin engaging with accountants and lending institutions. So basically, EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So why, why is EBITDA so important? Well, today's independent pharmacies are a lot different than they were 20 years ago, 10 years ago, heck, even five years ago. Today's independent pharmacy is a varied marketplace, and we have noticed that some of the most successful pharmacies are providing a, a variety or a combination of services in addition to their dispensing. And those can include long-term care, compounding, DME, specialty drugs, MTMs, immunizations, which I'm sure a vast majority are doing, maybe some 340B and maybe some point of care. Now, depending on the type or the combination of services, that a pharmacy is offering, you will definitely have different cost of goods, operating expenses, and eventual gross profits. Uh, for example, a typical retail independent pharmacy that's also doing some compounding services and that's use a, an estimate the total sales of $3 million. We'll have different cost of goods, operating expenses, and gross profits than just a typical pharmacy just doing dispensing of prescriptions. 
as a matter of fact, you would expect to see uh, a retail pharmacy with compounding having a higher gross profit percentage and also most likely higher labor costs. Conversely, a pharmacy dispensing a fair amount of specialty drugs, you would ex expect to see a higher total sales, but lower gross profits. Therefore, any financial model that is focused on EBITDA most fairly values the true business of that pharmacy. So now that we have defined EBITDA, how, how do we calculate? Well, quite honestly, EBITDA is the net income of the business from the, the P&L, but we're also going to add back any interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortiz amortization. So in essence, EBITDA equals net income from the P&L, adding back any interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Now, we're, we're far from done by doing the EBITDA calculation, and there's one very important additional step that we need to do, and that is normalization or normalizing EBITDA. Now, you'll hear normalization and you'll hear another term uh, that is synonymous with normalization, and that is add back. So once we look at the net profit from the P&L and we add back any interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, we must also do additional addbacks or additional normalization of any non-business, personal, or above market expenses that may be included in the pharmacy business. Now, uh, I'd like to go over some of the, the more common ones that we typically see uh, in a uh, P&L from a retail pharmacy. One of the first ones is owner salary. Now, most independent owners pay themselves more than they would their, their staff pharmacists or pay themselves more than their PIC. And in almost all cases, they're gonna be paying themselves more than what a new buyer buying the pharmacy would pay themselves. And, and de deservingly so. Um, you, you independent owners have earned it, but any extra salaries, any extra bonuses, or any extra distributions that the pharmacy owner is going to give themselves that will not be forwarded over to the buyer must be added back to the EBITDA or to normalize the EBITDA. Just real quickly, um, Let's say that the owner's salary is $180,000. Now, typically us using a benchmark for a new pharmacy uh, buyer owner may pay themselves say 130,000. So what we would take is that extra $50,000 and add it back to the, to the EBITDA. One of the other more common areas we see is, whoops, sorry other salaries. Now, we see quite a bit family members draw salary or they receive other benefits, but they may not actually be working in, in, working in the pharmacy or perhaps they are actually doing work for the pharmacy, but their salary is excessive for the type of work they do. We actually, a, a common question we ask as we be, uh, a pharmacy owner as we begin evaluation is, are any members of the owner's family on the pharmacy payroll? And if so, please list their names, their responsibility, and their fiscal year salary. To try to take a look at, will these be salaries that the, that the buyer will need to match in hiring new people? or that will not need to actually hire people and those above 
those above average salaries we're going to add back. A very common area. Now, if a pharmacy owner also owns real estate or owns the building that the, the pharmacy is being run out of, and typically that owner is going to have two corporations. They'll have one corporation for representing the pharmacy business, and in most cases, they'll have another corporation for the real estate. So a common question we ask is, are you paying a reasonable rate to the real estate corporation, if you will, based on the trade area and based on the, the square footage? Any amount of rent, if you will, paid above the normal or the average rent must also be added back. And, and this is a typical add back we see quite a bit. And lastly, personal expenses. Now these will be any expenses run through the pharmacy that have no direct relationship to the business. And some of the, the, the common ones that we see are uh, memberships, uh, maybe some auto expenses, personal cell phones, not only just for the, the pharmacy owner, but maybe for the entire family. Uh, we may see owner or officer life insurance. And one of the favorites that we, we had seen in one previous um, valuation that we does is the alleged uh, delivery boat. Now, again, when we are normalizing or we are adding back it, any of the expenses from the P&L. These are expenses that will not be carried forward by the buyer. So to, to summarize everything, uh, as part of a, a valuation written statement, this is typically what you could expect to see uh, an ad back documentation to look like. First of all, from the, the P&L, we have the unadjusted net profit of a little under $330,000. So we found depreciation. We had a family member salary adjustment need to be made, uh, an owner wage adjustment salary. Uh, there was a life insurance policy for for the owner, uh, personal cell phone. There was a Colorado truck included in there, and there was a rent adjustment. And just to reiterate on that, in this particular rent adjustment, the uh, pharmacy was paying uh, the real estate corporation owned by the owner four thousand dollars a month in rent. The actual trade area of and rent, the average was 1,500. So we basically took $2,500, took it times 12 months, and we added that all back to the, uh, to the EBITDA. So we were left with a total adjustment of a little under $120,000. Now, you see I have listed there something called discretionary earnings. This is another term they'll be used as part of the valuation to uh, describe all the ad backs. So when we were done, we, the unadjusted net profit or the EBITDA of 329,000 with the discretionary earnings of a little under 120,000 left us with an adjusted net profit of Four hundred and forty-nine thousand five hundred and thirty-two dollars. So, um, I want you to pay close note to the adjusted net profit per percentage. We have that listed there of um, fourteen point two percent. And as we move on to the the formulas, uh, we'll show you how that adjusted net profit percentage has a very direct relationship to how we calculate fair market values for all the formulas. So let's move on to the formulas. 
Um, many of you, or we get a lot of questions all the time that, that there must be a single all-purpose formula that can be used to determine fair market value. However, uh, that's not the case. There is no formula that we use. And as a matter of fact, here's an example of some of the formulas we have seen from various um, firms that do valuations, whether they're a, a wholesaler or a chain pharmacy. These are some of the ones we, we see. There's 14 that I have listed up there, and quite honestly, there, there may even be, be more to that. Now, even though I said there's no single formula, I do want to point out that it is essential that when you're conducting a valuation to determine a fair market value, that you should use multiple formulas. That way, this would represent a more reliable way to determine a range of values. And typically, you're looking for a low value and average value and then a high value, which based on a fair market value, the actual appraisal, if you will, or valuation of the pharmacy, the, the sell price should fall somewhere in between those figures. So now the five formulas that we will be reviewing, and these are the five formulas that um, are time tested that PRS uses in our valuation. And one of the main reasons we just feel they provide a broad assessment of a pharmacy value from, from several perspectives. And those are profitability, inventory, sales, total income, tangible assets, and intangible assets. So Again, as, as I said just recently, we like that our using the formulas we use tend to be an all round encompassing assessment uh, of the value of the pharmacy. So let's move on to those five formulas. First is the percentage of sales. Now, quite, quite easily, we're gonna look at the total yearly gross sales of the pharmacy, which combines the, the prescriptions, the OTCs, immunization, any DME, any sales coming out of that pharmacy. Now, uh, and this is the, a very important part, the actual percentage number we use of those sales is clearly dependent on the adjusted net profit percent, percentage we calculate, calculated, sorry, by normalizing EBITDA. So, for example, let's say if you remember on the summary, the adjusted net profit being uh, maybe 3%, 4%, something like that, you may see the percentage of sales at a number of, say, maybe 20%. As that adjusted net profit increases to, say, 5%, or increases to 10%, or in the summary that we did, 14.2%, you're gonna see that the percentage of sales number we use there increases proportional. And, and it's pretty easy to figure out that the more profitable pharmacy, the more cash flow the pharmacy uh, has, the higher the value of the pharmacy. The second, is return on investment. Now, with a typical uh, pharmacy, you should expect a return on investment of about 20%. So this one is pretty easy to calculate. We're looking at the normalized EBITDA or the adjusted net profit, the, the terms are synonymous, and we divide by 0.2 and that should give you one of, the, one of the values. The third is direct assessment. Now, this by far is one of the more cumbersome calculations, but I'll, I'll try to do my best to, to explain it um, 
so you can understand. Now, this direct assessment was originally established by the Bank, Bank of America. So basically, direct assessment equals the sum of tangible assets plus intangible assets. Well, sounds pretty, pretty simple so far. So what are tangible assets? These are items that, that can actually be counted. And in a, a pharmacy, a tangible asset quite simply is inventory plus furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So we all know and have it documented our inventory number. But how do we value for a, uh, a pharmacy valuation the furniture, fixtures, and uh, equipment? So in most community pharmacies, they're, they're generally the furniture, fixtures, and equipment is fully depreciated and it's given a minimal value. And on average, we typically see FFE at about $10,000. Um, now, that amount can be a little higher if there's something new or significant uh, inside the pharmacy, such as possibly an automated uh, dispensing machine, such as a a Script Pro or a, a Parada, or a medication adherence uh, packaging machine such as uh, Rapid Pack. Or one of the other items we may see is if this pharmacy has a very large out front uh, area, we may see that $10,000, uh, we may give it a 15,000 if they have some, you know, a lot of uh, shelving or maybe some some expensive sh shelving. But in, but in most cases, again, furniture, fixture, and equipment without <clears throat> any um, newer significant items is typically between 10 to 15%. So, um, so that's tangible. Now, how do we get to intangible assets? So first of all, these are typically items that can't be seen, touched, or measured. So, in a pharmacy, that would represent something like, what's the value uh, of the customers that patronize your pharmacy? So quite simply though, how do we calculate something that we can't be seen, something can't be touched or measured? Well, intangible asset calculation is extra earning power times year of profit factor. And I, I know you're sitting here, what the heck does that mean? And, and here comes the cumbersome part, and I'll try to explain this for you. Basically, the extra earning power means how much more money would a buyer have by buying the pharmacy versus not buying the pharmacy? So this is how we would calculate that. Let's say the buyer does, let's calculate not buying the pharmacy. So basically you take the tangible assets and if you've taken that amount of money and invested it, say in the stock market, what could you realize? So for example, the inventory that says $190,000, furniture, fixtures, and equipment is $10,000. So we have tangible assets of $200,000. We take that $200,000 and we invest it in stock market at 10%, we're left with $20,000. In addition, we have to calculate the what would that, that pharmacist earn by working somewhere else. And using a benchmark of $115,000, we would be left as if this person didn't buy the pharmacy they, and just invest in the money and work somewhere else, they'd have $135,000. Now, let's calculate if they did buy the pharmacy. And I'm gonna to try to use um, some of the financials we used on the previous summary. So let's say by buying the pharmacy, they can realize an adjusted net profit of say $450,000. Also by being an owner of the pharmacy, that buyer, buyer may give themselves a, a little bit more of a, of a um, a raise and the typical benchmark we use for a pharmacy owner is 130,000. So 450,000 plus 130,000 
that buyer could realize a $580,000 by buying the pharmacy. By not buying the pharmacy, we realized the number of 135,000. So that left us with the extra earning power of $445,000. Hopefully I was able to try to explain that. Now let's move on to the years of profit factor. This is a number that typically varies between one and five. Uh, that in, indicates the approximate number of years it would take a newly opened pharmacy to get to the financial position of the pharmacy were valuing. So a value of one would be for a pharmacy that wasn't very profitable and a value of five would be for, for a pharmacy that was extremely profitable and stable. The average year of profit factors typically three to, to four. And in this particular case, we're going to use four because of the uh, adjusted net profit percentage. So we took the extra earning power, 445,000, took that times four, and then we added that the, to the tangible assets of $200,000 and we're left with the calculation for direct assessment. Number four formula, and this is percentage of sales plus inventory, furniture, fixture, and equipment. Now, similar to formula one that was just percentage of sales, the, the percentage that we use is proportional to the adjusted net profit percentage. The higher the adjusted net profit, the higher the percentage of sales numbers we use. But note that the percentage of sales number we use in this formula, formula four, will be less than the percentage we used in one because we are adding back inventory, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And again, the percentage we use varies based on the adjusted net profit percentage. And the last is net profit approach. Quite simply, this is your adjusted net profit times a multiplier plus inventory and furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And here, here comes a, a, another statement that you've heard quite a bit. The multiplier number that we use is dependent upon the adjusted net profit percent. Typically, we're going to use a number somewhere between three and four. And in this particular, it can be adjusted by quarter percentages also. So between three and four, depending on the adjusted net profit percentage is the multiplier we, we use. Now, earlier I, I had said that there's no single all-purpose formula that can be used to determine fair market value and that is true. And again, a multiple formula approach is the best way to go. However, and I wish to take note of this, the formula we're looking at now, the net profit approach, this one tends to be scrutinized a lot more by the lending institutions. It just seems in our experience, they tend to pay a lot more attention to, um, to uh, this formula when looking to approve a loan. So, so let's look at the summary. So we're gonna take the, the calculated amount for the five formulas that we used, and that'll be, that will give us a range. You'll be, there'll be a low figure and there'll be a high figure. And also more importantly, we'll get an average. Now that average, will represent a fair market value for the pharmacy. And I, I want to add, it will be inclusive of goodwill. It'll be inclusive of inventory. It'll be inclusive of furniture, fixtures, equipment, customer files, records. It'll be inclusive of, uh, of everything to determine that fair market value. However, as stated previously, it will not include any cash, accounts receivable, accounts payable, any real estate, 
land or any liabilities. Now, if that is eventually going to be included in the in the final selling price, that must be negotiated between the uh, the buyers and the sellers. Now, now that we have determined a fair market value and and we have determined a, a price range for the pharmacy, I want everybody to realize that the final selling or the purchase price is going to be arrived through negotiations, obviously. And, and it can be influenced by a lot of subjective factors based on not only the buyer's perspective of what's, what's important to them, but also by the lending institution's uh, perspectives on, on items. So let's take a look at some of the real common factors. First is quite simply curb appeal. How, how does your pharma, pharmacy look? Does it need a remodel? Um, does it need a coat of paint? Does it need flooring, ceilings? Um, maybe some, some new fixtures. Second, competition. Um, how many and the type and who are the major players, especially if you're competing against a very strong independent. Also, any proposed new openings coming into the trade area or more importantly, any closings that may, may be coming in the future could have an effect on uh, that asking price. Third, inventory. Obviously, Inventory is a direct factor to, to the purchase price, but be aware of, say, the OTC, are, are there dated gifts or, or are the products out there um, shop-worn? Is there any sellable merchandise? I, I know, I don't know how many pharmacies I've gone in and, and seen wooden American flags, flags in the corners that you know, basically these items that the buyers not want included in calculating the inventory amount. Then we're looking at the, the prescription inventory is the, the amount of your inventory too high for the average script count. And if so, the buyer may be asking you to clean up your inventory or putting into the purchase agreement that they're going to put a cap on the amount of inventory used to calculate the, the final selling price. Other ones, trends. Is it a growing, declining, or a, a stagnant area? Are there empty storefronts? Uh, on the other end, uh, a positive would be, is there any new um, home developments uh, nearby that could uh, be a positive for, the, for possibly increasing the, the selling price? Third party contracts, you know, do you have a good even mix of uh, third parties or are you dependent on one predominant third party because of the major employer in your tra trade area? How's the pharmacy trending? Are sales increasing, decreasing, or are they being level? And, and one of the main reasons of the asking for the last three years financial data that we did is to take a look at the trend. Uh, lease terms. If you're um, renting your area, do you have favorable lease terms? Um, do you have favorable renewal terms? And if so, can the buyer just assume those um, when they buy your business? And also, now, if you own the building and you're selling it, is that going to be affordable to the buyer to include it into their loan? This is a this is probably more dependent upon uh, the lending institutions. Really take a, a look at this. Is your prescription volume pre predominant based on a few or one predominant physician that the this may scare some of the lending institutions away because what if that physician left the area or the physician no longer is practicing could have a direct effect upon your, your, your volumes. On the, likewise, 
the percentage of controlled substance, again, lending institutions are really scrutinizing this lately. If, if a large percentage of your total sales volume is controlled substances, the lending institution may not wish to include those sales numbers in the loan or may outright just reject the loan of the buyer. Terms of the sales, is the buyer or the seller going to offer some owner financing? And if they are, what is the interest percentage and also the length um, of the term? A real big area is how many interested buyers do you have? You know, obviously if you only have one, one buyer, it really affects the ability to negotiate. However, your negotiation can increase considerably if you have multiple buyers. Is a buyer a, a current employee? Maybe a, a pharmacist you had working for you for the last couple of years and you'd really like to sell it to them and they would really like to buy it. Um, there, there is a possibility you may be offering a hometown discount. And quite honestly, the most important, believe it or not, is how badly does the seller want to sell and how badly does the buyer want to buy? How motivated is each party in getting this, this deal done? So, next steps. Now that we have the valuation and you're well aware of uh, some of the factors that may affect the, the, um, the actual selling price, Let's move on to the next steps. Now, the selling and, and transferring the business is a long process. Um, and on average, it can take anywhere from about nine to 12 months. Now, the, the lesser amount is if, if you currently have uh, a buyer who has approached you, maybe, as we said, maybe one of your employees or maybe another um pharmacy in your area that wants to increase market share may be willing to buy your pharmacy. But if you have to go to market or you have to um, find a buyer, it, it could take 12 months. Now, you may ask yourself, what, why is it going to take so long? And, and a couple of the, the, the main areas I want to point out is, and I'll be talking about this um, very shortly, is on the selected buyer, they're probably going to ask for a due diligence period, which typically could take maybe about two months there. Um, the speed or lack of speed from, say, accountants that you'd have to use, not only yours, but the buyer's accountants, your attorney, uh, maybe the buyer's attorney, how long is it going to take each party to prepare review and finalize all the vital documents. And probably the, the factor that's, that's gonna take the longest is the buyer acquiring fi financing, especially if they're going to be getting an SBA loan. Throughout the years, an SBA loan typically took about three months. And what we're noticing right now is a lot of SBA loans were used for the business PPP loans. Thus, we're even seeing longer for uh, potential buyers to get their loans approved. And one other item I want to bring up is the actual final approval of a buyer's loan cannot be started until that bank receives a fully executed purchase agreement, which tends to be as you will see here shortly, one of the last steps in the, in the selling process. Now, as I stated just recently, selling can be a complicated and it can be a time consuming endeavor. Um, but if you're prepared and you surround yourself with competent, competent professionals that understand the entire process from valuation to closing, and also a complete business transfer, you can make this process much smoother and seamless. So uh, if you've never gone through this before and you're, you're beginning to do this for the first time, make sure you surround yourself with some people that can really help you speed things up and do it correctly. So 
Let's go to the, the steps the, to selling a pharmacy. Now, I want to go over the, the 10 basic steps in the selling process, basically to give everyone, whether it's a seller or, or a buyer, an idea of, of what to expect. Um, by no means is this meant to be a, a comprehensive guide to buying or selling a pharmacy. It, it would be too time consuming to, to address the complete list of the many details involved, but we'll focus on the overview. So what you can, you can expect the process to look at. So here we go. First two steps, obviously we, we have reviewed and uh, the valuation, obviously, step number one, as I just recently said, trying to, if you never went through the selling process yourself, try to partner with a experienced, um, an experienced professional. Step, step three is a non-disclosure agreement or an NDA. Now, when you're selling your pharmacy, confidentiality matters and confidentiality is, is crucial especially as it applies to your staff. If you're going through this process, you don't want your staff to know or anybody to know that you're, you're looking to sell the pharmacy. And even more importantly, you don't want your patients to, to know you're selling it. Um, this is pretty, pretty basic and, and probably makes sense to a lot of you. But also, never discuss any aspects of selling your store to a, a potential buyer without having the buyer authorize an NDA. Uh, I don't care if a buyer called up and, and says, Mr. Jones, um, would you be in? Uh, I heard that um, you may be looking to retire. Would you be interested in, in selling your store? Don't mention anything, even if you are interested, get an NDA first. So if a potential buyer doesn't sound, doesn't sign, uh, an NDA, well, they must not be interested and you have no further discussions with them. Number four, qualifying the buyer. Now, if those of you that don't have a buyer and um, it, and you're going to market, maybe you're using a brokerage firm or what else, please realize you're going to get a lot of false inquiries from from, from buyers who really aren't interested. They just like to see what's selling out there and the going rates, or more importantly, they don't have the necessary capital to even buy your pharmacy. So um, eliminate early on any people that, that as you're qualifying, you feel aren't interested in, the, in considering the pharmacy. You're, you're busy enough with trying to go through the intricacies of selling a pharmacy at the same time, trying to manage your business. You don't want to waste time with unqualified people. Step five, schedule a meeting. Now, th this is a, a very important step and also is um, another way of qualifying people. Um, try to set up any interested buyers to come in to your pharmacy after hours. Obviously, it has to be after hours. Um, on weekdays after the pharmacy closed or maybe a Saturday afternoon on a Sunday and due to confidentiality. Again, this gives you another opportunity to possibly meet face-to-face. -face. You can continue with your questions. You can con um, continue with um, getting a, a idea. Is this someone you wish to con continue with? Now, Obviously, if a buyer does not want to schedule a visit, I, I think they've qualified themselves as not being interested and you can move on with other buyers. The letter of intent. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of, of time on this. After all your potential buyers have visited, uh, the next step is to ask for a letter of intent or another term, an LOI. And when you ask for this, also put a deadline for them to submit this letter of intent. Again, another qualifying step. And I would keep it pretty short from anywhere from say two, 
no more than three weeks from after they have visited the pharmacy. Now, what is a, a, an LOI? This is basically a non-binding document of the intentions of the buyer. Again, another qualifier. Um, or if they're interested in continuing after they have received all your financial data, after they have visited the pharmacy, after they have looked at it, after they have asked you a lot of questions, are they interested in moving on? And if they are, they should complete a letter of intent. And in general, you want that letter of intent to include as many negotiating points that are going to be included in the eventual purchase agreement. Again, being it's non-binding, you typically wouldn't need a, an attorney involved but you want to try to get as many negotiating points involved without an attorney to keep your attorney fees down. Some of the items you, you want to see in there is um, the down payment. Is there any percentage down payment the buyer's going to put in? This is where you're going to ask uh, whether this is going to be a stock or an asset purchase or the, the buyer really um, doesn't care which one. You're going to ask, is the buyer going to be requesting any um, owner financing? And if so, what are they going to offer percentage rate and term? Uh, are, are they interested if the building's for sale, are they going to be purchasing the real estate? Or um, if you own the building, they're only interested in leasing off you. You want that determined in the letter of intent. And also uh, how they're going to calculate not only your your prescription inventory, but how they're going to calculate the um, the the um, OTCs. So once you receive all your letters of intent, now it's time for you to to choose your buyer. Now you're going to choose one who suits you the best. Now not only with the financial offer but also who do you feel you're most comfortable with and who you will feel that will carry on your, your legacy. So as you choose your buyer, quite simply, you know, obviously you can call them up and, and let them know, but also you sign your letter, letter of intent and return to them. Now that we have our buyer, we move on to the due diligence period. Now, Typically, the buyer will include in the letter of intent a due diligence period of, say, 45 to, to 60 days. If they ask for anything longer, they don't need that long. Try to keep it between 45 and 60. That should be more than enough time for them to complete the process. Now, what is due diligence? They're basically going to verify all the documents that you had provided them, all the financials, um, even down to say wholesaler purchase records, or they're gonna look to verify sales figures, or they're gonna look as a percentage breakdown of all your third party plans. They may be looking at employee payroll reports. It, and basically a, a due diligence, they're, they're gonna be asking to take a complete look of your entire pharmacy operations. but um, please note also, and I want to put uh, say to this, that typically a, an experienced buyer or a buyer that may be having a uh, professional working with them is probably going to request that your pharmacy is off the market during this due diligence period. You can't uh, reach out to any other potential buyers and you can't accept any other offers to purchase. So be aware of that. Now that we move on to the actual um, purchase agreement. Now, after the buyer is satisfied themselves with all the accuracy of the information, <clears throat> we now move on to the purchase agreement. Now, quite honestly, this is the legal and binding sales agreement and it is created by attorneys. Um, it is our experience that most times we see the, the buyer's attorneys uh, put together a purchase agreement. But if you as a seller have more experience than the buyer doesn't, it really doesn't matter which one creates the purchase agreement. But um, either way, an attorney get involved with this. 
And what you want to do is all of those negotiating terms from the due diligence or any of the negotiating from the letter of intent, hopefully we're just transferring those right over into the definitive purchase agreement. Also, this purchase agreement will either be created as a stock or an asset purchase agreement. And for those of you that, that may not be familiar, basically a stock purchase is where the buyer purchases complete shares of the corporation, uh, directly obtaining ownership of the seller's corporation. Whereas an asset, the buyer is forming his or her own corporation and just purchases the assets uh, of the seller's business, such as the goodwill, inventory, furniture, fixtures, equipment, files, et cetera. Now, I, I do wanna add here um, about the purchase agreement that most attorneys, or, or you may be using the attorney you've used for years, most they do have experience in completing a typical purchase agreement and doing a typical business transfer. However, many may not have the knowledge and experience to complete the intricacies of a pharmacy license and PBM transfer, especially as it pertains to uh, the State Board of Pharmacy, as it pertains to the DEA regulations, as it pertains to NCPDP, as it pertains to the MPI. Also realize that the timelines or the requirements and the protocols that are required can vary between all the licensing agencies based on whether it's a stock purchase or an asset purchase. So again, the actual protocols, the actual requirements and the specific language addressing the transfer of PBMs and the transfer of all the licenses must be addressed through contingencies into the purchase agreement. So what does that mean? So either ensure that you're, the attorney you use has experience or you surround yourself with a, a, a professional person who has experience in transferring pharmacy business. And this will save you a, a lot of time and save you a lot of headaches down the road. So what is step 10, the closing? Now, after all the contingencies have been met, uh, as spelled out in, in the purchase agreement, and also that the buyer uh, has gotten their loan approved, now the closing is, is scheduled. Now, I do wanna point out one, one item I haven't covered. There will need to be a final documented inventory um, of both your prescription and your OTCs uh, to get a final selling price. And typically the, the inventory is conducted uh, as close to the closing date as possible. And most times it's done either the day or the evening before the closing. So I, I, I wanted to point that out. Now, the sale is, the sale is complete, and this is the ultimate outcome to a successful pharmacy purchase and transfer, and I'm sorry, transition. Now, I hope you have gained some insight into the valuation and sales process, and now we'd like to review some of the questions. All right, Scott, thank you very much. Uh, let me, um, so we're, we're, what I'd like to do now is read some of the, uh, some of the questions um, that we have. And if any of you have any other uh, questions that you don't get to, or that we don't have time to answer on air, uh, let me put up our um, screen here again. Sorry, I minimized that. Um, let me put, that's our contact information. So if there's a question you have maybe afterwards, uh, that you didn't get to today, feel free to uh, call or email myself or, or Scott. 
But in the meantime, I, we do have a few questions that came up. So let me start with these. And, and if we do run out of time, and again, don't get to your question, um, you know, we'll be sure to respond to you within the next couple of days. Uh, the first question came up. Um, so you had mentioned during the, the purchase agreement discussion, the timelines and requirements, they can vary uh, different. They can vary between a stock and asset purchase. Could you expand a little bit on that? Uh, that's a very good question, and and sometimes is is bypassed during a the selling of a pharmacy. First of all, every state board of pharmacy determines change of ownership differently. Now, if you're doing a a asset purchase, that will always be a, a change of ownership and you have to plan accordingly. Uh, also need to look at the state board, their change of ownership application, does it have to be done prior to the closing date? And if so, how much time? Or can it be done within 10, 30 days after? So you have to plan accordingly. Now, when it comes to a stock purchase, state boards of pharmacy determine change of ownership with stock differently some states may not consider a stock transaction as a change of ownership it may only require you to notify them via letter other states consider a stock purchase a clear change of ownership and then there will be other ones that depending on the percentage of the stock change would consider a change of ownership so in essence as part of the due diligence period, making sure, and prior to the purchase agreement, making sure you understand the timelines and everything involved with the transition of the of the licenses. And uh, as said earlier, those need to be included in the purchase agreement. All right, thanks, Scott. And another one, uh, mentioned, you'd mentioned some contingencies. Could you list uh, 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 what the, some of those could be? Uh, another good, and these are all parts of the, the purchase agreement, and they would include some uh, non-compete agreements, uh, power of attorneys for the transition. Uh, if the owner or the sellers is having um, owner financing, a promissory note, uh, you'd have to document some of the fixed assets, uh, employee lists, meaning the employee number of hours, their salaries, and uh, lastly, intellectual properties. Okay. And we'll see if we can get to, to one more here. We, we ran a little over here. Um, but let me, um, you know, let, let me just let me get to one more question. For those of you that won't get to, we will email you um, a, a bit later, th these responses. Um, the next question, uh, when considering the purchase price, do you ever compare it to a sale to a chain? We do not, yeah. uh, and, and mainly at, at PRS, we're through the selling process, we're totally dedicated to keep an independence independent. So um, if a, a person comes to us, we typically only go to market with keeping the legacy and keeping a pharmacy independent. Hey, um, everyone, again, I, we, we did run over here, and thank you for your time. For, again, those of you that did submit questions, we will get an answer to you here shortly. Um, I also want to mention I've been asked about a recording being made available. We will make this recording available. We're getting through some other webinars first, so we'll make that available to you. Um, it, it'll be on our website. Um, and again, uh, thanks to everyone for joining us, and we hope everybody has a great day. Thank you, everyone.